hunger. The Horn of Plenty had a special significance. It was eternally filled with food. Bowls, jugs, chalices and cauldrons were all considered magical vessels. The earliest Grail story is a poem in which Arthur and his men go in quest of a magical, a magical vessel, a cauldron, uh, which uh, cauldrons were regarded as magical very often in the old Celtic mythology. Then what happens uh, is that the story of the quest is taken up in the Middle Ages and the, the vessel is turned into a Christian object, but certainly there is a pagan background here. According to Celtic tradition, the legendary King Arthur set off on a mysterious voyage to find the magic cauldron. His perilous journey began on a lake that led to the underworld, the kingdom of the dead, believed to be at the center of the earth. Arthur was denied entry by a guard, but through cunning and valor, he managed to get past the ghosts and demons. And not only did he defeat the forces of the underworld, but he wrestled the magical vessel from them. With the vessel in his possession, according to legend, he became master of life and death. In one of the Grail stories, I believe, there is the notion of this magic cauldron, this cup of eternal life, this inexhaustible horn of plenty, just as there is the sword of light of the Celtic gods, which is then given to the heroes. The narrative and its protagonists, together with certain typical objects, all come from the Celtic realm. The Celts believed that nature was divine. Plants, animals, and even rocks communicated with human beings. Everything had a soul. The fairies, elves, and sorcerers found in modern fairy tales were believed to inhabit the natural world. They intervened in the fortunes of men. Priests were in contact with the beyond. The Celts gathered for regular worship in a magic grove. The priests and druids were the storytellers, poets and philosophers, and they possessed healing powers. Sorcerers blessed the righteous and cursed the evil. With their rites and incantations, they pacified the powers of nature. Deeply rooted in the Celtic belief system was the notion that warriors could be resurrected after death. The Celts were merciless warriors. Men and women alike entered into battle wild and unrestrained. For them, it was customary to behead their enemies, as a beheaded warrior could not be resurrected. This barbaric ritual may help shed some light on the story of the Grail. The Celtic relief on this vessel from the first century BC provides a clue to the story of the Grail. The prince on the left is plunging an unscathed warrior headfirst into a vessel. Below are warriors who have been brought back to life from the kingdom of the dead through the same process. Like the Christians after them, the Celts believed in resurrection. The discovery of the grave of a prince in Hochdorf near Stuttgart has astounded archaeologists. Inside the prince's grave, they found a bronze cauldron and an enormous drinking vessel, large enough to accommodate a human being. In all human cultures, drinking plays a special role. 
In many ritualistic practices, drinking serves a magical function. We know this to be particularly true of the Celts, who had magic vessels, vessels that could bestow salvation or special powers. This tradition is continued in the idea of the Holy Grail, the vessel that nourishes and brings salvation. After the fall of the Celts, the notion of magic vessels lived on, and the first stories of the Holy Grail were born. In the act of communion, Christians commemorate the Last Supper, when Jesus filled a chalice with wine to symbolize his blood. The chalice and the wine became symbols of eternal life. The events in the last days of the life of Jesus Christ are well known. The story of his crucifixion has been told, written and represented countless times. But there are lesser known sides to the story, and one of them involves the Holy Grail. According to legend, the Roman captain Longinus stabbed the crucified Jesus in the side with a lance. Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished merchant and a relative of Jesus, collected the blood of Jesus in the chalice used at the Last Supper. Many people believe that this chalice was the Holy Grail. All of this was claimed by the Church, and this Grail, that is the receptacle we call the Grail, was made out to be the container of the blood of Jesus Christ, collected by Joseph of Arimathea upon his descent from the cross. Jesus was placed in the family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea himself. These legends and traditions form the basis of the myth of the Grail and the impassioned quest for the Grail pursued by King Arthur's knights. His knights were initially nothing but simple warriors, but they needed an ideal, the chivalric ideal of the Arthurian legends. It was a quest for perfection, symbolized by the Grail. According to tradition, Joseph of Arimathea kept the chalice. But as a follower of Jesus, he was pursued, arrested and sent to prison. Upon his release, he abandoned his homeland, and following an ancient trade route across the Mediterranean, he travelled via Rome to the south of France. Joseph is believed to have settled in Languedoc, together with some of the other disciples, including Mary Magdalene. Could the Grail have made its way to Europe along this route? From an archaeological point of view, it's thoroughly conceivable that a distinguished man such as Joseph of Arimathea could have taken this vessel, which had been used on festive occasions such as Passover. Where the Holy Grail was kept once it arrived in Europe, nobody knows. There are many conflicting accounts. One of the oldest beliefs is that Joseph, and possibly even Jesus himself, visited Britain and took the Holy Grail with him. Joseph went ashore in the south of England and traveled to what is now Glastonbury. And it was here that he spent the rest of his days and founded the first Christian church on British soil. The site where the ruins of a Benedictine abbey stand is certainly one of the most sacred in the country, perhaps because it once saw the Grail itself. There are different versions of this Grail story. But in England, it was said that it was brought here uh, to, well, of course, the town of Glastonbury wasn't here then, but that it was brought here soon after the crucifixion, and then it was lost, and Arthur's knights went in quest of it. From this point on, the Holy Grail was closely associated with the legendary King Arthur and his knights. The Roman withdrawal from Britain in the 5th century was a disaster for the Romano-British left behind. Nothing could stop the barbarians flooding across Hadrian's Wall, once a secure border between the barbarian north and Roman Britain in the south. Without an organized defense force, the country soon fell into chaos. 
Only one British king was able to stem the forces of anarchy, Arthur. In a series of battles, Arthur defeated all the invaders. There followed a few glorious years of peace and stability. Arthur's achievements became the stuff of legend. He was the embodiment of Britain's golden age. And as the turmoil of the Dark Ages continued, people hoped for the return of a man like Arthur, or even Arthur himself. On a thin strip of land in North Cornwall stands Tintagel Castle. The walls of the ruins date from a later era, but the foundations go back to the time of Arthur. We cannot be sure of the dates, but it is believed the Celtic king was born here in around 470 AD. Beneath the castle is a grotto known as Merlin's Cave, named after the legendary sorcerer who served as tutor to the young Arthur. By now, many Celts had converted to Christianity, but pagan traditions still determined their way of thinking. The transition from the old to the new religion was a gradual process. In the myth of the Holy Grail, pagan and Celtic elements mix with Christian ones. The story of the magic sword Excalibur is Celtic. According to legend, Excalibur could defeat any foe. He who pulled Excalibur out of a stone would become the ruler of Britain. The legend proved true in Arthur's case, and the sword led him from victory to victory. At the end of Arthur's life, one of his faithful followers cast Excalibur into a sacred lake, in keeping with the Celtic tradition. Camelot, the legendary castle of King Arthur, and the place from which the quest for the Grail began. Historians still argue over whether this castle ever really existed. We have to be careful about Camelot. People sometimes think, oh, that was the capital of England in Arthur's time, but it wasn't. In all the stories of Arthur, Camelot is his headquarters. There's nobody there before him, there's nobody there after him. Now, of course, Camelot, as you see it in films and so on, could never have existed. There would never have been a great, magnificent medieval castle in the Dark Ages, in the fifth century, or whenever it was, but it's quite possible that Arthur did have a headquarters and there's a, quite a good reason to think that this was a place called Cadbury, Cadbury Castle. Cadbury Castle, the south of England. This man-made enclosure with earthen walls is one of the largest hill forts in the country. According to archaeological evidence, a large and impressive settlement was built here in the 5th century, the time when Arthur reigned. Could that settlement have been the castle of Camelot? <laughs> 